Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the third seminar in our department's research seminar series. I'm Zbigniew Wasilewski, Associate Chair for Research in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. I am pleased to have with us today Professor Kirsten Dottenham. Kirsten holds the prestigious title of Canada 150 Researcher in Intelligence Robotics. She is jointly appointed in our department in the Department of Systems Design Engineering. Furthermore, she is cross-appointed to the Sheraton School of Computer Science. Kirsten is the director and the founder of the Social and Intelligent Robotics Research Laboratory. Her areas of research include human-robot interactions, social robotics, assisted technologies, and artificial life. Kirsten, thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. The floor is yours. Thank you for this very nice introduction. It's my great pleasure to give this uh, distinguished uh, lecture here in the ECE department. So, I promise to uh, introduce in a few words what social robots are. They are robots, of course, but they are designed specifically to interact with people in human-centric terms and to operate in human environments alongside people. So this is very different from um, maybe 50, 60 years ago, where you did have robots in, uh, uh, for example, manufacturing contexts, but they operated behind uh, cages. It was dangerous for people to even approach them, let alone to enter that cage, because there was a danger they would be injured seriously. This is very different. These days, social robots are meant to operate in the environments where we as humans live, meaning in, in our homes, in our workplaces, in, in hospitals, in the therapy centers, or in many other um, environments and, and for many other application areas. They come in many shapes and sizes and forms. They can be humanoid. Um, humanoid robot means they have some uh, human-like characteristics. Typically, they have, a, they have a head, they have arms, they have a face. Um, they use verbal and nonverbal cues in order to interact with people, or they can have an uh, animal-like form. There are many robots that, uh, social robots that look more like more like pets. And what makes them special is that they engage people in a social manner, in an interpersonal manner, and they are able to communicate and coordinate their behavior with humans through verbal, nonverbal, or effective modalities. And these inspirations, of course, come very much from how people interact with other people, but also actually how people interact with their with their pets. Because when it comes to nonverbal interaction, uh, the way, for example, how we interact with our dogs or with our cats um, has many similarities to what is also important in human-human interaction. For example, uh, gestures, gaze, and so on. So, of course, not every robot has to be a social robot. It depends on the application area you have in mind. Um, if you have a robot you would like to send to Mars, there's no need for this robot to have particular social skills because there really aren't any people around. That's very different um, uh, to application areas, which you see here at the bottom, for example, robots that are meant to operate in, in hospitals or in therapy centers or in nursing uh, care, uh, rehabilitation, um, or home care. For those type of robots, being social is not just an interesting and entertaining add-on. It is actually essential because what research has shown that if robots in those application areas um, are not able to interact with people in a socially acceptable manner, people just would not use them. So regardless of um, what a wonderful piece of engineering technology you might have produced with, with your robots where you as the designer and the programmer might, might think, oh, this is a really great piece of te te technology, people will love it. It doesn't necessarily mean that uh, people who are not programmers, who are not engineers would actually accept it. 
So these are uh, application areas where it is really fundamentally important to develop these robots, not just as systems that are that are functional and that are safe, that are trustworthy, but also systems that are socially acceptable. And in those application areas, you need to very carefully, do people have very close or only remote contact with people? Um, what is the robot's functionality? Is it a very limited one, for example, uh, a vacuum cleaning robot, or is it a multi-purpose robot? Is the role of the robot to be a tool, an assistant, or is it meant to be a, a, a companion or a co-worker? And so this will all determine how essential these social skills are. Now, I already mentioned this word companion. So what do I mean by that? Uh, this is generally understood as a robot that does not only have some useful functionality, so that it's able to carry out certain tasks, for example, to assist people, but also that behaves socially. So that is carrying out these tasks in a socially acceptable manner. So developing social robots for application areas requires a very human-centered approach. You typically need to involve your, your users, your envisaged users from a very early stage of, of the design, even before you have uh, started any implementation. Typically, people would use a co-design approach or a um, that's also called participatory design. Um, and it typically goes through various iterations of, um, uh, for example, doing focus groups and interviews with uh, potential users and going through iterations of uh, prototyping the system, testing the system, then going back to prototyping and so on. So it's very important to get feedback from potential users of the systems and other stakeholders during this whole process. Most of the time that I've done research here in Waterloo was during COVID-19. So when I illustrate to you some of the research that you've done, you will appreciate that we had to operate under uh, some very unusual circumstances where we had very limited access or, well, basically no access for an extended period of time to so-called users in face-to-face -face interaction. We had to find ways in how to remotely carry out those studies. Now, these are just some of the robots that we have in our lab, these uh, social robots. So you can just to show you the spectrum of having uh, different appearances from more human uh, humanoid robots, as you can see here on the left, to more animal-like uh, robots. Now, when it comes to um, these different types of robots, it has been shown that the appearance of the robot and as well as their intelligence, the way they, they are able to adapt, the way they are able to make decisions, plays an important role. So just to illustrate one very, very popular concept that many people in uh, human-robot interaction discuss is the so-called uncanny valley. It was proposed many decades ago as a theory by Masahiro Mori. So what this basically shows is that here on the horizontal axis is the more and more human-like uh, robots become, um, the more familiar they become. So the vertical axis here is the familiarity. And sorry, you can see here that this curve goes up, up to a certain point, uh, which is called the uncanny valley, which is when these machines are very human-like in the way how they behave, in the way how they look, but people still perceive that there's something wrong with them. These are not humans. And this can create the effect that people find very repulsive. Um, and this is what robotics designers try to avoid, the so-called uncanny valley. So in a lot of research, people stay on the more left-hand side of the uncanny valley, not trying to replicate human-like appearance and behavior faithfully. What is very interesting with this theory also is that uh, Masahiro Mori predicted that the behavior of the robot, the way how the robot moves, actually has a much stronger contribution to this uh, so-called uncanny valley as opposed to the just the pure appearance, just, you know, when you see this robot uh, shown on a, on a picture, for example. So as I said, this is a theory. Many studies who have tried to find support for this uncanny valley, and many of these studies found it, but um, there's also a discussion in the field to say 
that uh, this would really depend on the particular robot and the way how it has been designed. But still, I think what is interesting here is this fundamental insight in how the movement and the appearance of the robot in the sense of how human-like it is, can change the way how people react to systems. And that's indeed a very general theme which we find in the field of uh, human-robot interaction. Also, people's views, when you do experiments uh, with people, um, people's views of robots and robot cognition is influenced by a number of factors. There's, first of all, this um, uh, well-known tendency of people to, to anthropomorphize. We are anthropomorphizing nature. We are anthropomorphizing our, our pets, and we are also, also anthropomorphizing robots. Of course, our views are also interested by um, influenced by uh, movies. We, we watched uh, science fiction stories we read and our own personality, our own experience, our own preferences. A very famous uh, short little video here. Psychologists um, Fritz Heider and Mariana Simmel, they conducted in 1944 a video study, how we, how we would call it these days, where they just showed people geometrical black and white figures moving on a screen. And in one of the groups uh, in the study, they, they simply asked people afterwards, what, uh, please describe what you saw in that video. And what people did, did describe were not geometrical figures moving on the screen according to certain trajectories, but they described agents. They described features with certain goals, with certain intentions. For example, this uh, large triangle um, was often depicted as a bully trying to bully this uh, small, small circle. So this is what I mean when I talk about anthropomorphism. As soon as people perceive so-called intentional agents, as soon as they seem to perceive that this agent is moving on its own um, initiative and seem to have certain goals, people will start anthropomorphism morphizing that agent and same applies to robots too. What is also interesting to consider is when you do experiments in human robot interaction and you develop systems for certain application areas, is the um, are different units of interaction as it has been described in a, in a recent uh, introductory book to HRI. It is not only experiments you could do where one person interacts with one robot. You could also have many people interacting with, with one robot or even many robots interacting with one person. And in the study that you do, you do not only always need to consider the people directly involved in the interaction, but also the organization, the context in where these robots are being used and being operated and where people are interacting with them. And of course, there is this much wider uh, space to consider, which is the, is this, uh, is the human society at large. So developing companion robots, these social robots, is scientifically challenging and exciting, but why do we need those? And just very, very briefly, um, uh, 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 many uh, research projects investigate robotic assistance for people with special needs. Um, these are just some statistics here from, uh, uh, from, from Canada. And disability, of course, creates a significant education gap, a real age, wage gap, and it uh, also significantly impacts on unemployment and poverty, uh, poverty. So any systems that can be developed in order to address some of those issues, in order to provide assistance, um, could also make a, a, a contribution to this uh, um, uh, factors. There's also a lot of discussion these days about these so-called cobots. These are robotic co-workers that can be used in industry working alongside people. And um, it has been hypothesized that while uh, these days uh, we might be in the age of uh, digitalization with increased automation, connected devices, AI, um, the future industrial revolution might be with an emphasis on personalization, where the focus is on cooperation between people and machines, where people work alongside robots and where we take advantage of the capabilities that humans are good at and the capabilities that robots are good at. Another 
area is related uh, to developing robotic assistance for an aging population. And here's a little bit of statistics from Canada, but Canada is not the only country worldwide where you have a growing aging population and where these numbers are expected to increase. And this puts a lot of strain on the, on the health system, but also on family caregivers who are providing a very significant amount of uh, unpaid hours of care. So the idea here is not to replace human carers, but to provide assistance. And I will later uh, illustrate it with some examples. There's also the more general area of healthy, healthy aging. So to try to support independent living in people's homes uh, as long as possible before people have to be admitted to a care home, for example. And there are different types of assistance that uh, robotics researchers here are studying. This could be robots providing physical assistance or cognitive assistance, robots that could be an exercise or a nutrition coach, and also robots that might provide uh, social Systems. And this um, area of supporting healthy living can also be applied to support residents and, and carers in, in care homes, in, uh, in smart homes, for example, where these robots might be integrated in an, in an ecosystem of uh, other smart devices in that, um, in that home setting. So this is just an illustration of some of the physical assistance is work that I've been involved in at University of Hertfordshire in the UK. So for real world applications, uh, robots need to be not just look uh, social and uh, they have social behavior, they also need to be socially intelligent. So what does that mean? It means they need to be able to learn and adapt in real time to people, to, for example, their direct users. They need to be able to provide encouragement and assistance with the goal to influence positive and healthy behaviors in users. For example, if you want to use them as a, as a health coach or as an exercise coach. But how do you ensure a high level of engagement from the user? How do you create this robot so that it is able to adapt to people? How do you improve um, the quality of interaction? Robots should not only know on what, what people do, for example, by detecting um, where people are and their activities, but they should ideally also have access on how people feel. They should have access to their internal states, vital signs, stress levels, for example, because these could be very important signals that could be used to allow the robot to adapt to the person. So it would allow the robot to be responsive, to monitor their progress, to provide assistance and to provide support. And, uh, and for a health coach robot, this, this would um, allow the person's vital signs to stay within the desirable target range. If you have a robot, for example, as an exercise coach, you do not want, uh, want a person to over, over exercise and to exhaust them themselves. Uh, but on the other hand, you, you do want them to, uh, to challenge themselves. So there are many ways in how the social robot, when it is able to perceive these uh, internal states, these vital signs of people, can provide feedback in order to encourage people to uh, stay within the, the healthy exercise regime, for example. And this could be engaging people through the robot's movements, its speech, and its facial expressions or emotional expressions. And the long-term goal here would be for the robot to adapt to individual users and learn from multiple interactions. And so this is the motivation for uh, one of the projects uh, in the CERL lab, which is the HRI PhysioLib, um, a software framework to support the integration of physiological adaptation in HRI. And I just like to go into um, a little bit more detail here. So Going back to the social units of interactions, we're looking here at diets. Um, so a robot interacting with one person as a coach, for example, as an exercise coach. And this is um, the research team in Thurl who is in, involved uh, here, including uh, several graduate students, uh, in particular Austin uh, uh, Kotick. Uh, this is actually, um, this work is a key part of his MASC uh, thesis, which he will submit later this summer. So again, the motivation of uh, uh, to measure physiology in human-robot interaction is to improve the quality of interaction in order to reflect about the effective states of the humans. If you only use 
visual data, cameras, then you very often will encounter severe limitations depending on, for example, changing lighting conditions in the room or other real world noise, but also privacy concerns from end users. You do not necessarily uh, want cameras uh, to monitor you while you do certain, certain exercises. People might be concerned on who is actually able to share uh, this data. And physiologically sensitive systems have previously been used to improve uh, the user experience. So there's a body of work that we could actually build on. So here you see an illustration on how these uh, experiments typically work. Very often you have a control group and you have a comparison group. Um, then you have a, have a baseline and you have a condition where you want to evoke certain responses. For example, you present certain uh, information uh, and, uh, to the uh, participants and want to see how they react. Or like in our case, you expose them to, uh, to exercise. And then in your experiments, in the measurements that you take, you can look at the reactivity. Um, so how do the control group as well as the comparison group, how do these vital signs uh, change um, if you compare baseline and the emotion provocation scenario? Sometimes you are not so much interested in the control group, you would just be interested in how do, how do people respond if you expose them uh, to this particular condition. So physiological sensing can be done in many ways. As you can see here, you can uh, the measure um, ECG, so the electrical activity of the heart, uh, typically having electrodes placed on the skin. You could uh, measure EM, EMG, so the electrical activity produced by the uh, skeletal muscles or you could also measure electrodermal activity, which is another popular way um, in order to uh, detect effective states in people. So what we focus here in this particular project is uh, ECG. So an important concept here are these R to R intervals. So if you see in the slides here, uh, the abbreviation RRI, that's what it, what it stands for. It is basically used to compute the time and frequency parameters that can feed into the physiological loop in order to create real-time adaptations between the interactions of the human and the robot. And in particular, the heart rate variability can be used to infer stress, excitement, but also exercise performance. So as I mentioned, physiological signals uh, in principle um, uh, have been used and also some other application areas, but they have been rarely used to create physiologically adaptive behaviors in a social robot. And that's particularly what we are focusing on. The current main challenges in this area here is that interfacing sensors and robots can be very time consuming, also transforming the raw physiological data into usable features that you can use for the adaptation might require quite detailed knowledge on psychophysiological principles. And the existing software tools that we have right now commonly we, uh, are, uh, require licensing um, and do not provide support for real-time adaptation. So this is why uh, we embarked on uh, developing PhysioLib, which should address these limitations of these systems. So a general um, framework overview is on the left here, you can see the physiological sensing with different sensors that we have available and that we will also consider in the future. In the middle, you see the, uh, the processing module that is taking care of the uh, signal processing, but also the real-time adaptation, real-time in the sense of real-time human robot interaction. So based on these original signals and some, uh, uh, some filters, uh, we then also extract some features uh, in the time and also frequency domain that then can be used for adaptation using either heuristic rules or using uh, machine learning probabilistic approaches. And they can then this will provide information to the robot, to the social robot in order to provide feedback uh, to the user. And this feedback, again, it can be, uh, it can be um, facial expressions, it can be body movements, it can be speech. 
And we are also taking care of two very common approaches in robotics, the, the VOS and YARP frameworks. So most robots that are available these days, particular humanoid robots, they are using these particular software uh, systems. And our goal is really to develop this uh, HRI PhysioLib into a very flexible system that also other researchers can can use in order to interface various physiological sensors and use it for real-time adaptation with a variety of different uh, different robots. So this is just a little bit more detail about the uh, data acquisition where we use uh, the so-called um, LSL, the lab streaming layer, to synchronize physiological data. So the type of sensors that we use here on the left uh, are polar devices. One is a device that you attach uh, to your chest. The other one is a device that you attach to your to your arm and it allows to collect uh, ECG and also accelerometer uh, data. So this is the physiological input that we that we get from these uh, sensors that we used. And you see in the middle here on this slide, you see an app that we developed, um, which can show you in real time these particular signals coming from those devices. So this is just a little bit more detail into the uh, into the feature extraction, but I think I already explained that uh, in an earlier slide. So given the signals, uh, uh, we then have these uh, two possibilities, either heuristic rules for adaptation where you can say if the heart rate variability is reflecting some stress level based on literature in physiological heart rate data, then the robot should react in this particular way. So it would basically be a feedback loop where the signals um, are being processed and then they result in the robot creating certain behaviors uh, which are then being expressed and the person will then react uh, to this uh, the feedback which in return will then also change their own physiological signals. So it's this, it's this human robot feedback loop. So here you can just see um, uh, several robots that we are considering uh, to integrating. And in the middle, you see the QT robot. And in one uh, recent proof of concept uh, study to evaluate uh, that system, we use this robot that you can see here in the middle. This is just some more information on how the physiological uh, state data can be used in order to get information about stress, but also about workload, engagement, and so on, that then can be used for human robot adaptation. Now, let me uh, illustrate this, uh, this robot uh, that you can see here on the left, this humanoid duty robot, which we used as a physio coach. We developed it as a physio coach, as an exercise coach to encourage effective um, cardiorespiratory exercise. In this particular feedback uh, loop that I've already uh, shown you, so you have an initial configuration. We collect the signals from the two polar devices. We then uh, compute a certain target state. We then make a decision using some heuristics, whether the person seems to be over-exercised, under-exercised. Then the robot reacts with certain feedback, uh, sounds, postures, speech. And this then uh, in return will influence how the people react in this context. So the person here is also watching a video. So the person who is doing certain exercises here, these are some publicly available videos. And you see on the right how we translated these into movements of the robot. So on the left, you see a person performing these exercises, these different types of exercises, and on the right, how we translated this into movements of the robot. We were actually teaching the robot in order to perform these movements, as you can see here. So we were, due to COVID-19, we were not able to do an actual user study, but we were able to do a feasibility study in the lab in order to evaluate the system in a closed loop implementation where a person in real time performs these exercises and the robot responds in real time providing uh, feedback. So I'd like to show you this uh, short video here.
Okay, so this was just an illustration. You can see that there's various type of feedback from the robot in terms of movement, in terms of speech, um, but also music, um, which we modulated in order to help people adjusting. Of course, there's a lot of future work that would need it, uh, would be needed, for example, to compare um, how people perform in this context when they have such an adaptive robot as opposed to a condition where they do not have such a robot. And it could also have applications in other domains where it might be useful to use uh, physiological data in order to make these social robots adaptive. So one of these possible applications could be to use it for people with special needs, for example, children with uh, physical disabilities. And there's, in fact, uh, one project uh, in my team that uh, where we have addressed such work. This is the, um, uh, the master's project of uh, Hamza Mahdi, who will uh, soon submit his, um, his thesis. It was about creating MyJ, a new social robot design for robot-assisted play for children with physical special needs. So here we go beyond the human robot diet towards um, a scenario where you can have potentially not just one child, but pairs of children interacting, not just with one robot, but also potentially several of those robots. So children with uh, accessibility needs have barriers to play. Play is very important in, in child development for cognitive, emotional, but also motor development, development of self-esteem, for example example, learning also about social relationships, but it is very difficult for children with severe physical disabilities to engage with other children into physical play. So very often they might be able to play computer games, but of course a lot of child's play, typically very enjoyable play, uh, is, is physical play. So the idea was, can we exploit robots to create such joyful play sessions that facilitate human connection for children, regardless of their physical abilities. So we started with a co-design approach where we consulted with experts and therapists and then went through, uh, through several prototypes that we also presented to children and families uh, who have children with uh, the severe physical disabilities um, in order then to improve the prototype and, order to, and also to develop appropriate interfaces for that robot. So here you see the final design that you have. We, uh, we chose a ball game inspired by basketball, which is really, really popular here in Canada. That's what I learned when I moved here to Canada uh, two and a half years ago. Um, but of course, for many children, uh, it is not possible to play such balls. They would not be able to move around, pick up balls and shoot them at a goal. So we developed this robot with a very clever design that can actually shoot these these balls. It also uses uh, nonverbal cues such as movements, but also lights. I don't know if you can see these changing lights here over Zoom, but um, they are being used to also reflect directions of movement, but also internal states. For example, when the robot um, has success, uh, has scored a goal, um, then it could uh, via its light and its movements express a happy emotion. So this is a scenario where, for example, two children, let's say a child with special needs and a typically developing child together could play this game. Uh, they could either each have their own robot that they control or both of them together um, uh, could cooperate in order to control um, the robot. This is just an illustration about some of the designs and prototypes. Uh, that we did, and in particular, the internal mechanism that was developed and also various, uh, various sensors that you can see here and effectors. So we also very carefully designed uh, the shell. We took inspiration from the literature also on uh, robot appearances and in particular what is suitable for uh, designing a robot for children. So we went through these different phases where we had different alternative designs and then finally decide, decided on a design um, that you can see here in the middle where the robot is able to pick up the ball and then also to shoot it. We then also internally validated this robot, but due to COVID restrictions, we were not able to test it with, with, with children. But uh, we are hopeful that we uh, would be able to do that in future. And the plan is also to make it available open source so that anyone who would be interested in uh, having such a robot could be able to 
replicate the design. There are, of course, many, many challenging, uh, many challenges here and also directions for uh, future work. We would have to test the acceptability and also trust the children, the carers, relatives and therapists would, would have um, in such a system. We would also need to investigate uh, whether such a robot could engage children, not just initially in an initial session, but also long term. And of course, um, we would need to uh, consider how could such systems actually be deployed. Now, let us go back to the diet of human-robot interaction. I just uh, briefly want to illustrate another project here, which is not targeting an application area per se, but is more about fundamental research in how can you how can you teach robot and how do people perceive a robot that they teach. So here it was particularly investigating how a robot's um, a learner robot, a robot that has been taught certain behaviors, how its gaze and arm motion kinesics and other nonverbal cues would influence how people perceive the robot's confidence, eagerness to learn and attention to the task. So uh, the nonverbal cues or interaction kinesics um, uh, play a very important role generally, not only in human-human interaction, but also in human-robot interaction, and also in particular in social learning, in scenarios where you want to teach the robot and you want to learn the robot through the interactions. Now, due to COVID-19, we could not do an in-person teaching scenario where an actual person is teaching the robot, but we were able to uh, carry out extensive studies where we presented people remotely online with videos of robots that have been taught. And in these videos, the robot showed different non-verbal behaviors, and we could then measure how people perceive these non-verbal behaviors. And we were particularly interested in, uh, in gaze behaviors and arm movements of the trainee robot, of the student robot, so to speak. So we did a design where we had two groups of people, um, participants in one group, they were being told uh, that um, they are now watching the robot executing that learned task right after they instructed the robot. And in the other one, they were told that um, the robot has already practiced uh, that behavior uh, for uh, two days. And then each of the participants watched 12 videos in a random order where we modified the gaze. Uh, the robot either looked at the teacher, always at the teacher, always at the task, or we had a combined gaze mode. We also modified the arm movement from low speed, smooth movement, high speed, smooth movements, hesitant movements, as well as uh, jerky movements. So each participant watched and rated these different um, uh, behaviors. So here you can see an example of some of these behaviors. So on the top left, uh, an example of gaze at the task with hesitant motions. And on the left bottom, example of gaze at the teacher with uh, jerky motions. Or on the right, uh, you see the combined gaze mode with um, here high speed smooth movements. So we then afterwards, after people watched these videos, we presented them with a questionnaire where we asked them about uh, how would you rate the behaviors of the robot. We recruited in total um, 197 uh, volunteers using Amazon Mechanical Turk and 167 of these responses were usable. Um, we did not find an effect of the priming. So people reacted to the robots uh, very similarly in these two conditions of whether they had just taught the robot or whether they had taught the robot a few days ago. So we then pooled the data and uh, analyzed it statistically using uh, uh, linear mixed effect models. And so, so briefly, the results are that when it comes to the perceived confidence with high speed smooth movements, the participants rated the robot significantly uh, more confident, while with when the robot performed hesitant movement, it was a sign of uncertainty. When it came to eagerness to learn, combined gaze mode resulted in the highest perception of the eagerness to learn, and high-speed motions could also significantly improve the perception of the robot as being 
eager to learn. And finally, when it comes to attention to task, when the robot always looked at the manipulated objects, so at the task, it was perceived as more attentive to the task, which is quite straightforward and uh, expected. But high-speed smooth motions improved the perceptions of attentiveness to the task as compared to the low-speed smooth movements. So this shows that the non-verbal cues of the robot, the way how it executes the tasks in terms of its arm movements, but also in terms of its gaze, significantly influences how people perceive that robot. We did not find any significant differences between the two priming groups, as I already mentioned. We also found that when there was a slight fatigue effect in the perception of the robot's eagerness to learn, after all, each participant had to watch uh, 12, 12 videos. And also we found that as the age of participants increased, Participants evaluated the robot to be more attentive to the task and to be more uh, proficient and calm. And we speculate that probably it could be explained uh, uh, due to younger adults having higher expectations of the robot's uh, skills. Of course, there are many limitations to doing these uh, uh, HRI research projects during COVID-19 where we cannot have in-person uh, studies, so we have to resort to these virtual methods. We couldn't do any real teaching. We have actually addressed this now and since then done another remote study where people are actually able to, to teach the robot, um, and we have just recently submitted that to a conference. But we are also, of course, definitely looking forward to future in-person studies. So I already mentioned uh, companion uh, robots doing tasks well and doing them socially. Um, a lot of research activity currently on uh, in the field of uh, healthy aging, as I already explained, uh, with an aging demographics. The idea is to keep older adults to live independently in their own homes or in assisted living environments as long as possible, which has benefits in health and well-being as well as economic benefits. And it's particularly attractive in a smart home context where you can integrate smart sensors with robotics uh, technology. So the idea here is not to replace human contact, but to take advantage that these smart environments, including social robots, put on a 24 seven basis monitor uh, people. It would complement carers, whether formal or informal carers, who might only be able to uh, visit a person once a day or twice a day for a few minutes. Um, these systems would be around 24-7 and they would be able to, for example, alert carers or even emergency services if they would detect um, that, there is a, uh, that there is a health problem. So there are many considerations in this context. So you would need to consider, um, and I can't explain this uh, all in great detail, but just to show you there is a big a number of considerations in terms of what type of support should the robot have. Should it just give physical assistance? Should it give cognitive assistance? Should it be a health advisor or even a health coach, as you have seen in the project that I introduced a few minutes ago? Should it provide uh, social assistance? Could it encourage people, for example, to connect with, with other people in the neighborhood or in the, in the family? Could it possibly help with, help with loneliness? Who are the robots assisting? Is it the older people themselves or is it their support and care staff? What roles do the robots have? Should they be fully autonomous? Should they have just one limited functionality or should they have many functionalities? Where should the support happen? Should it uh, be in their own home? Should it be in a hospital um, or other environments? What type of functionality should the robot have? Should it also, in addition to supporting healthy aging, have other types of assistance, such as cleaning, housekeeping, which uh, uh, most people, if you do surveys with the general public, uh, one of the top tasks that everybody says, oh, I would love to have a social robot that could actually help me doing household chores. So that's not only specific for older people, I think uh, also for the more general public, they would welcome such application areas. But also we need to consider what are our ultimate motives. Uh, why are we developing such systems? Is it about uh, cutting staff costs? Is it about compensating for a lack of staff available? With an increasing uh, aging population, um, there's also an increasing lack of staff, qualified uh, staff that is available. Is it about providing enhanced care? Are there things that the robot could do that is very difficult for people to do? So for example, a robot is very patient, 
if it's useful for the robot to repeat a certain interaction with the person again and again and again, it's no problem for the for the robot. Robots are actually very good um, to carry out repetitive tasks. And as I mentioned, there's this advantage of providing 24-7 monitoring or assistance um, uh, support. So the final project that I'd like to um, very briefly uh, motivate um, is a well, it's not just a project, it's a research program I've been pursuing since uh, 1998. It's um, robot-assisted therapy for children with ASD, so children with autism. And we've done many, many of such studies. And uh, I will just illustrate a particular project here that we published only last year, and it was a field study. It was a long-term study where we had a robot, a humanoid robot, um, being used in a, uh, in a nursery school for children with, uh, with autism, uh, not by researchers being present, but it was actually used by the teachers and staff in that nursery. So we, the researchers, uh, sometimes went in in order to do interviews uh, with the with the carers and teachers in order to get feedback on the robots, but otherwise they use the robot themselves. And this was really an exploration of using robots in the wild, outside the lab, which is really important in not just this application area, but any application area where you want to explore how would people actually use that that robot. We all know how researchers would use that robot, but how would people, how would care staff, teachers interact with that robot? How would the children interact with that robot in long-term interaction? And in this study, it, it was a one-year study. But also, what are the effects of the more organizational, of the wider organizational um, issues? How would the system fit into that school? How would it fit into the curriculum? How would it not disturb what the teachers and staff anyway are supposed to be doing in that context? So we were very interested in, as I said, we as we the researchers sometimes went in the beginning of the study, in the middle of the study, and towards the end to do interviews in order to find out about the extrinsic benefits, about the intrinsic benefits, about the ease of use of that system, about the intention to use. So did the users actually want to use that robot? It was the humanoid robot Casper that we developed at University of Hertfordshire in our team. And also actual use. How did the intention to use the robot translate into actual use? So we used a particular uh, technology acceptance model. There are many of such models available in the literature. This is a very simple one, and we had to use the more simpler version of such models because uh, we, had a, uh, we had a small sample size. So it didn't make sense uh, for us to use the more elaborate uh, models that have been postulated later. So we used uh, Davis's technology acceptance model, as you can see here with these aspects and factors to consider extrinsic benefits, ease of use, intrinsic benefits, intention to use and actual use. Uh, we had these three visits, as you can see in the table here on the right, um, after one month, six months and 12 months. Participants were four primary participants. These were the were the were the users so these were uh, three users staff and volunteers as well as a fourth one in a more manager role we also had 19 secondary participants so the children with autism attending uh, the nursery we collected different types of data staff data notes from interviews and questionnaires but also child data, changes in the children's scores on developmental scales. Since we wanted to see not only what is the acceptance of uh, the staff at, in that nursery school of the robot using it long term, but also did the use of the robot have any impact on the development of the children. So this is the robot, the Casper robot that I already uh, mentioned. I won't have time now to show a little uh, a video of the use of the robot. Maybe if there's time at the end, I could come back to that. So this is uh, um, an illustration of the distribution of the interactions with the robot and the length of the study period. And also here an illustration of the changes in the developmental domain scores. So as I said, we wanted to see if the children actually benefited in that 
development uh, from interactions with the robot. So we documented changes here on these uh, uh, scales regarding uh, sensory abilities, communication abilities, cognition, uh, social and emotional abilities, but also motor abilities. We also learned a lot in order how to modify and improve the, the interfaces. Um, so for example, how the, uh, how the staff in the nursery could operate um, uh, the robot using uh, a keypad. So in the in the last um, uh, visit, so just to illustrate some of the feedback thoughts that we got, we learned that uh, the staff had gained a better appreciation of the way that some children might want to interact um, with the robot, uh, since they realized it is not only a benefit if the children directly interact with the robot, sometimes a child passively interacting it could also benefit from it. And this could be part of a wider familiarization process. They were also much more aware of the different roles that the robot could play for different children, which again points to the need to, to personalize these systems, to really adapt the systems to the individual needs and preferences and abilities to individual users. There were also issues to consider in terms of space. So the staff realized that uh, they needed a dedicated space for the robot and they actually um, then did some fundraising in order to have a dedicated room, to build a dedicated room where they could in future uh, uh, then use that robot. They also realized in terms of staff that it really required all staff to be flexible with that uh, uh, tasks and that it was really necessary to not just train one staff member to use the robot, but actually several so that there would be a backup if at uh, uh, on one day, for example, one staff member is not available. Also regarding the children, the nursery uh, provided, of course, a big variety of different activities and uh, practices for child-directed learning. So in a way, the robot sometimes competed with other activities that the children might be interested in, which then also pointed towards the fact that it's necessary to to, to integrate the robot into the schedule, into the curriculum, um, uh, so that you don't have this issue of competing activities in order to exploit the benefits of the children interacting um, with the robot. So as I said, the children definitely saw this as a very positive factor. Uh, the staff said they had learned a lot, not only as individuals, not only as a group, but also as an organization how such a humanoid robot could be used in a rewarding way for children and staff in a long-term period. And as I mentioned, in particular, finding a place for it in a well-established uh, practice of childcare. So on more general reflection, I need to come to, uh, to a close now, but there were really these different, three different aspects you need to consider spatial, you know, space, having space for the robot, a dedicated space. You need to consider staff available and you need to consider benefits for the, for the children. So I won't go into detail uh, about the technology acceptance model, but uh, we generally see that there was a good level of acceptance and, uh, but also a learning curve for us as the researchers to understand the complex interactions of these different factors of face, staff, and children, um, and with regards to the actual uh, intention to use and the actual use of that robot that need to be very carefully being uh, considered. Okay, so just as a final uh, comment, um, there are in this field, of course, many uh, many issues here. Many research groups, many companies are producing robots now, specifically designed for children with special needs. But um, the use of these robots outside research projects is still very, very limited. A lot of research funding goes into this area. But what do we actually leave behind once we um, once we finish such research? So in the in the UK, 
um, in the project I just described, the long-term study, we were, we were lucky that we had a dedicated research team that could long-term provide support. And although the particular study was only for the duration of 12 months, um, the robot has still been in use uh, five, five years later, but only because the university provided dedicated support um, uh, for that nursery school. So I think I should I should stop here. So these are just my just my final remarks. So I hope that in my presentation I gave you an illustration of what social robots are and how they are used in uh, different projects on human robot interaction. I illustrated it with a number of different research projects um, uh, here at uh, University of Waterloo in particular. And I also pointed out after all the difficulties people uh, uh, like us in this research field face during COVID-19. But uh, we, we had to be creative and uh, we moved our, uh, our studies online or we found ways in order to still move this research for forward, even if we do not have access to, um, uh, to actual users, such as children, uh, children with special needs, older people, um, or actually any type of participants in order to do face-to-face uh, -face, uh, human robot interaction studies. Okay, thank you. So I'm happy to answer any questions. So the first question is, can you please tell us in what semester you'll be teaching your next Systems Design 750 Social Robotics course and what are the re prerequisites? Oh, um, <laughs> there are no prerequisites and I'm teaching it again in uh, exactly one year time in winter 2022. Okay, so our next question is, what is your opinion on the development of sex companion robot as? It's not an area that I'm working in. It's not an area that I'm interested in. A lot of people ask me about it. My personal opinion is that it's difficult to judge it. It certainly, we need to very carefully investigate and also do studies and to also regulate on how these systems are being used, how they're being marketed, and what could be the potential advantages and disadvantages of these systems. So I think the development of these systems should not just be led by uh, economic concerns of saying, oh, you know, we can maybe sell thousands or millions of those. There is a need for that. But I think it needs to also be looked into very carefully because there are some serious ethical issues um, involved in it. Okay. How do you validate the performance or quality of an interaction? Are there specific metrics used? That's a very good question. Um, there are indeed many, many metrics used. So um, very often in human computer interaction and human robot interaction alike, people use subjective measures, for example, questionnaires. But of course, that only reflects on what people think about the interaction, uh, typically retrospectively after the interaction is already over. So personally, I'm very fond of observational measures where you actually measure what people do. How do people actually behave towards the robot? What decisions do people make? And then to design experiments where, um, you know, given how people be behave, what decisions they make, how they interact with the robot, how they look at the robot, how they respond to the robot, we could we can measure all of these things. And then we could also correlate them with the more sub subjective measures from, uh, for example, questionnaires or interviews. Okay, I don't have any more questions in the chat. So I don't know if you want to wait a minute or two, or if you want to wrap it up. Oh, hang on, here we have one. What are the advantages of simulated agents versus physical robots? Are certain areas in HRI more predominated by one or the other? Well, HRI from the original idea, I would say, people want to have physical robots. They are interested in using physical robots that interact with people. There is indeed a lot of research that shows that people respond to physical robots much more positively than towards a virtual agent. For example, you can have a, have a humanoid um, embodied conversational agent that very much looks like a human, has uh, face, facial expressions, gestures, speech, and so on, but is virtual. 
and you can do comparisons in how people react to such an agent as opposed to a physical robot or even to a robot that's being shown on a screen. And research shows that when people interact with a physical robot, um, they do not only engage more with the systems, but they also are more likely to, um, to follow instructions because it seems physical robots have more authority. And this, in a way, makes sense. I mean, let's say you have a certain application. I mean, I gave the example of an exercise coach. You can also have an exercise coach on your, on your cell phone, uh, on, your, on your smartphone. So, um, but if you have a, uh, have an, just have an, have an app, uh, then it's very easy if you, uh, you know, don't like it particularly if you maybe get tired of the exercise, you can just uh, switch it off. If you have a physical robot, a physical robot has a certain presence. It shares the same space. It engages with people also in a, in a temporal sense, in real time. You cannot stop the robot as such, um, not in the way as you can just pause a screen agent. And uh, so in applications in particular, when it comes to assistance, when it comes to robots assisting people, coaching people, where you want the robot to have, or you want the agent to have authority, a lot of research shows that uh, it's a very good idea to have a physical robot. But of course, now during COVID-19, uh, a lot of research studies had to uh, uh, be moved uh, remotely where people use, uh, use videos and where we, as you've seen, or using uh, simulations. But this, these results that we gain from these studies and also other research groups need to be validated in future with in-person, face-to-face studies where you have an actual robot in the same room with participants and you observe how people interact with that robot. How much interest from industry do you see at this point? There is generally a lot of interest. I mean, you have uh, very often uh, new companies developing and uh, selling new robots, new social robots. Um, sadly, in the last few years, um, a lot of those uh, uh, software companies actually went bankrupt or they withdrew the products. And there has been a lot of discussions. I mean, I could, I could give another presentation for about 20 minutes on what people in the field discuss are uh, the reasons. For example, one of the factors that people say is that very often when people create a promotional video of the robot, they are basically presenting it as an all singing, dancing robot with almost human-like intelligence, hum almost human-like uh, uh, abilities, which raises expectations that necessarily social robots have to disappoint. Robots are nowhere near uh, the intelligence and the physical and cognitive and social abilities of, of humans. So uh, this is one, uh, you know, one argument that people say that maybe those companies who in the end, uh, uh, although initially they were successful, in the end, long-term, it could not be, the market could not be sustained. Maybe they were just making too many promises. Um, or some one other argument is that, um, um, that maybe in terms of the designs of the robots, people very often take a too strictly engineering approach rather than in involving from day one when they even plan to develop such system to involve designers, to involve artists, to involve people who actually have very rich knowledge and decades of experience in order to create interactive artifacts. So these are just two of the reasons of, um, that people discuss why some of these uh, software companies have uh, failed. But still, you, you, you still have many, many of, of those companies. And I am quite hopeful that, uh, that there is a big, well, not just, not just me. I mean, people in the field, if you also read business reports, um, there is a strong feeling that there is a very strong market in that area. We just need to get it right. So the next few questions are actually along similar lines. Why do you think it is that industry hasn't caught up to research when it comes to using social robots for, say, children with special needs? Well, there are robots now being sold in that domain. 
um, the the now robot, for example, or the Xeno robot, also the QT robot, they are specifically uh, being sold also for use for children with special needs. But again, that goes back to what I just said. Very often, these systems are have not been tested in terms of actual use usability, actual use in the context of um, of a school or a, a therapy center or even. Uh, home. Very often, uh, these systems are being developed uh, from a purely technical point of view, which makes them great robots and great research platforms. And this is the reason why also in my lab, we have many of those systems. They are great systems, but, uh, but much more work, in particular interdisciplinary work, co-design, where from day one you involve potential users into, into the design, also people from other fields, artists, also social, social scientists, psychologists, uh, therapists. Um, you need to have this more multidisciplinary view rather than just approach it from a, from a technical development point of view. Do you think there's value for social robots in industry? Could it improve the quality of human robot collaboration? Yes, absolutely. I mean, this, um, these application areas that I uh, illustrated, so the robotic co-worker, uh, the use in, uh, for children with special needs or robot assistance in order to um, uh, support healthy aging and healthy living, I think there is a huge potential uh, here. Have you considered integrating Professor Elias Smith's neural engineering framework, motor control research, or other biologically plausible approaches to AI in your software implementation? Well, it depends on the particular research projects. So some of my research projects are more inspired by uh, biologically inspired research in terms of the cognitive architectures, for example, that we are using. Um, that would be the area of human-robot interaction, which is more concerned with the cognition of the robot. But there's also the area of HI, which is more concerned with the, with the human-centered approach, where you actually want to deliver an interaction experience that meets the particular needs and preferences of people. So I think um, using biologically inspired architectures um, uh, is definitely a very interesting area of research, but it depends on what the focus of your, of your research is. Do you want to have a fully autonomous system or do you want to have a system that, is, uh, that has interfaces which allow users and uh, carers, for example, and children to interact with this robot in a comfortable way and in a more therapeutic and assistive context. So that is less about building fully autonomous, biologically inspired robots. How do you envision the societal impacts of widespread use of robots? For instance, are you concerned about a future where robotic automation causes job loss and ultimately leads to wider economic and social gaps between different socioeconomic classes? Yes, I mean, this, this is, these are very, very valid concerns. And I think last year we even had a, had a panel here um, uh, chaired by, I think, Professor William Malik in um, MME uh, on this on this topic. There is certainly, uh, I mean, like with, like with any innovations uh, that are coming, like also with AI in, in general, I think at the moment, um, at least in my view, uh, it's not so much robots that take jobs, it's more AI that takes jobs. So um, to, the, to which extent AI or AI robots, to what extent uh, robots will have, have this negative impact on the, on the job market remains to be seen. Because after all, these robots also have to, be, have to be built, they have to be maintained, they have to be serviced, they have to be programmed, um, which is also opening up other types of jobs. But yes, these are definitely very valid concerns that need to be discussed and that are not solutions that can be made by individual researchers, but that have to be made really by all the stakeholders in, involved and by society at large. With the development of internet slash network technology, do you think it's still important for a social robot or interactive robot to have a physical body? Yes, I do firmly believe so. For the reasons um, I had indicated before, 
that studies show that people respond much more positively um, towards a physical robot as opposed to just a virtual robot. If, if there are no more, no more questions, yeah, thank you. Thank you for attending my presentation. And yeah, thank you for the invitation to give this talk. Kirsten, thank you very much for the wonderful talk. And, and we had a good discussion. And I was, you know, as a panelist, I, I, I found myself actually at disadvantage because I, I was trying to push some of my questions there. And, uh, and you know, it was actually tricky, you know. So, so I will be asking them, uh, you know, I guess later on. Uh, and um, of course, uh, the, the, your presentation is going to be uh, soon posted for those who would like to review that. And, uh, and uh, you know, your email address is there. So you may be seeing a lot of uh, inquiries um, after that. But uh, for me, it was uh, quite a discovery and a very nice feeling that uh, here at ECE, uh, of course, you know, University of Waterloo brought the context, but that we we do have the the you know such a implications of uh, of um, you know social uh, aspects uh, of robots uh, rather than just just robots. Okay, so uh, now so we don't yeah we don't have any more questions. So at this point, once again, thank you very much for the great talk. And uh, uh, well, I invite everybody a month from now to to our next uh, presentation uh, by by Steve Smith, I believe. Thank you for for attending to to, to the audience. Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Andrea, for uh, handling the question and uh, uh, answer period. And uh, have a great day. Okay. Right. Yeah. Thank uh, you. Bye bye.